The Mind Tech Podcast, Episode 9, for May 9th, 2013. Raspberry Pi in the Sky. My Tech Podcast, episode nine. Nine weeks in, Joe. Nine weeks in. I'm Gareth Davis in Los Angeles, California. Once again, I'm joined by Joe Resington in London. Hey, Joe. Hey, Gareth. Yeah, nine weeks. Uh, I never thought it'd last this long, but here we are. We're in for the long haul, man. Almost double figures. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Next week. Yeah. Hey, any luck? Let, let me ask you. Um, you mentioned in an email the other day that you went out and saw Oblivion. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw it. Um, yeah, at the cinema, and it was uh, yeah, it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen it then? I did. Yeah, I went to see it uh, last week, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about Oblivion, the latest uh, Tom Cruise sci-fi epic. He does do a lot of science fiction movies recently, doesn't he? Yeah, in the last sort of ten years, he seems to be doing almost. I keep, everything. I keep thinking. I, I wonder if that if that has anything to do with his faith. Hmm. <laughs> uh, but what did you think of it? What, what, what did you think of Oblivion? Yeah, it was good. I mean, visually amazing. Yeah. Um, and pretty good story. Although it was the kind of story I'd, we, I don't want to get too much into spoilers, but it's like when when you get the plot twists in retrospect, they were really obvious. Right. Yeah, um, I, I I pretty much feel the same way. It, it, it wasn't a bad movie. It was it was okay. Um, it wasn't amazing. I mean, usually my 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 my, my law of uh, of discussing things usually fall into three categories: it either sucks, it's okay, or it's awesome. Yeah. This this movie was okay. Yeah. Well, it wasn't helped by the fact that, uh, firstly, two seats away from me, there was a mouth breather. I don't know if he had a blocked up nose or something, but every quiet bit was just. <sighs> a mouth I, I thought he was asleep at first, but then no, it was uh, all yeah. the way through. Um, and secondly, somehow, I don't know, don't ask me how, I don't have much experience of going to the cinema. I ended up, it started, subtitles come on. I thought, what? What? On <laughs> fucking all the way through. Subtit- I went to a subtitled one. Yeah. Like, Are you I serious? was wondering why there weren't many people there. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on a second. They have subtitled movies? Yeah, yeah, well, like for the hard of hearing or whatever. Are you fucking serious? Yeah, well, this is a big cinema, man. This, they have like 19 screens. So. There's, there's nothing like that over here, dude. Really? They have um, audio description as well. Um, oh, my for, God. For visually impaired. You can plug headphones in and get, a, you know. V- you guys are mental for the p- PC here, the politically correct nonsense. It's political, political, political correctness gone mad. There are, yeah. there are, there are the fucking, no, we don't have none of that over here. You, you, you know, you're deaf. Don't go to see the fucking movie. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Stay home. Read a book. That's terrible, but, bro. <laughs> But no, no to be honest, it was actually quite <laughs> handy in, at times because when they sometimes they and you think what what, what? what is it was right there and I, so I understood everything that was the only time you go to the movie theater in the U.S. and see a subtitled movie is if it's the latest documentary from Czechoslovakia yeah. or, or some shit like that. Regular movies, no, there's, there's no, there's no uh, fucking subtitles. I mean, when you, when, you know, when they come out on DVD or, or, or Blu-ray or whatever, then yeah, you know, then you can flip the button and the subtitles come on. But in in the yeah. movie theater, no, never, I've never seen that unless it's a foreign movie. Well, it was. I must have just missed that it was going to be subtitled. But I, I went into the cinema and it was quite big, and I got there as the scheduled time to start was. I think twenty to eight. And then obviously sat through 20 minutes of adverts and trailers and stuff. And the whole time there was just no one there. There was one row of people pretty much or two rows of people. This uh, cinema must have held, I don't know, Huge. maybe 400 people. And yeah. there was only about 30 in, in there. So Man, that's, I'm, that's I'm, still, uh, why. I'm still reeling at the, the, the subtitled movie theater for an English language film. That's, that's staggering to me. I cannot believe that. Well, we're um, we're all about the political so correctness. so bizarre. 
Well, it's so, not that bizarre, really. I, oh, I think no, that's, it's a good that's thing. weird. If, if people want to go to the cinema and they're not necessarily deaf as a post, but if you're a little bit hard of hearing and you struggle with a bit of the dialogue, then it's ideal, isn't it? And it, sometimes when there's loads of action and explosions going on and they're shouting, rah, rah, you don't yeah, you quite don't catch what's being said. Um, wow. So, yeah, it was quite, quite useful. I just got used to it in the end. So I didn't, didn't ruin it. And I was sitting right in the middle in quite a comfortable seat with no one in front of me. Yeah. Um, I'm, surprised part- they, I'm surprised they had seats in there, though. What if someone has a bad back and they can't sit down? <laughs> Shouldn't they have theaters for people just to stand? Mm, maybe they will one day. <laughs> but anyway, back to the movie. Um, I don't know. There's not much to say about it, is there really? It's just sort of a standard sci-fi yeah, mystery. I, I found it. I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Visually, it was stunning. The, the, the design elements of the movie were breathtaking. The, yeah, uh, his uh, his helicopter slash. Uh, oh, it was awesome. Uh, that uh, was awesome. Yeah. The, every, the design of everything was just like jaw dropping. It was beautiful. Um, whoever designed that movie, you know, the, when they do the Oscars next year, I don't know whether he'll win, but he sure as hell should be nominated because the design and the look of the movie was off the charts, spectacular. Um, but story wise, I found it kind of predictable. Uh, it, it was not the the brightest of stories. Um, but it was adequate to 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 keep watching because you're you're thinking, oh okay, I know what's happening. Let's see if I'm right. Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But one thing that really jumped out at me, and it seems really relevant to a lot of the the mindset chatter at the moment, and that is the the fact that it was all about the drones. Drones. Yeah. Ex- exactly. Yeah. Big time. And uh, it, I found the, the most interesting thing I found about the drones was their sound. Yeah, the sounds that they used, like it, it was very much the, like uh, sounds that 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 you would hear on um, emergency vehicles, you know, like f- fire engines and all all this kind of, uh, but 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 done in a very ominous way. Um, the, the sounds they made were not friendly <laughs> at all. Yeah. I mean, do you think it was a statement against drones then? Do you think it was a subtle way of whoever made the film saying that drones are bad? Um, no, I mean, the, the, the drones in the movie were, were near, neither good nor bad. They were just drones. Um, well, they were just at the, at the behest of whoever was controlling Exactly, them. right, right. Yeah, which is the same with all technology, right? Technology is neither good nor bad. It's, it's, it's whoever's controlling the technology. Drones don't kill people. People, people kill people. people. Well, yeah. I mean, as as as, uh, as trite as that statement may sound, it, it's it's true. You know, I mean, a car can be uh, used to trans- transfer people to hospital or, or mow down a, a, a bu- and kill a bunch of people. It's not the mm. car's fault. It's the the person sitting behind the wheel, right? Yeah. Uh, the the danger with the drones, though, is is when you when they become advanced enough to become autonomous which which these drones kind of sort of were uh they they were still in control of the of the the the, the people <laughs> if you can call them people um but uh but they still had basic programming you know if i encounter this my options are this this and this depending on this i'll choose this yeah you know, basic kind of uh programming rules for them to follow um but that's that's kind of scary you know when when they are autonomous like that, because mistakes can be made, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, if they're programmed to kill humans, you know, if they saw a baby, they'd kill the baby. There, there'd be no kind of uh, moral or or thought. So it would just be like, oh, there's a human, boom, dead, on to the next. You know what I mean? It'd be, it'd be nothing. Yeah, that's why they need the three laws, the Asimov. <laughs> yeah, right. What, what were they? The shall not harm a human? I can't remember what they are. It was like... Uh, you can't harm a human. Uh, something like you can't. Um, you can't allow harm to come right. to a human, um, and, you, and, uh, and you must do what they say. There's one uh, self-preservation. You know, I, I must do everything I can to survive, unless it involves harming a human. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. The yeah. three r- rules, Asimov's rules of robotics, mm. that we just. Anyway, so destroyed. out of ten, then what would you give up for them? <laughs> um. It's difficult. Uh, visually, I'd give it a ten. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean the the uh, advances in 
effects and CGI have really, the, you know, this is... You know what's amazing, though? I saw a behind-the-scenes on uh, on YouTube. And you know those scenes they did when they're in their their house floating in the sky? Yeah. And, I've heard that. It's, that's uh, rear projection. It's right. not CGI in the exactly. sky because of all the shiny surfaces. It was yeah. really there. And it looks... It's breathtaking. It looks amazing. Yeah, I'll have to dig that video out and have a look at it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, v- visually I'd give it a ten because visually it was it was stunning. Um, I loved the way the moon looked after it had been destroyed. Uh, yeah, the moon- although uh, scientifically inaccurate, a lot of people say it did. It was stunningly. Uh, I thought it looked amazing. Yeah, and uh, I had a dream. I had a dream. Of, I don't. Know if I, I've had a dream about the moon exploding years and years ago. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm. And it was. I remember being. Really, really unnerved by it. That's not going to explode, according to David Icke. It's a, a supercomputer <laughs> or something that's controlling us. And... Um, but yeah, I like I like the uh, the moon thing. I thought that was cool the way that looked with the moon uh, exploding. Yeah. Speaking of moon, have you seen the film Moon? Yeah, yeah, I did. And uh, without getting too much into spoilers, there's a there was it certainly tipped its hat to it. To, to well, the Oblivion tipped its hat to Moon. I would say it did. In which way? Uh, it's difficult to say without getting into spoilers. Well, it's, okay. it's relatively he's, new. So. Okay, folks, if you haven't seen Oblivion, uh, forward 30 seconds. Go ahead. Um, okay, right. You've, this is your last chance. Um, just with the clones and stuff, how there's just oh. loads of him. And, oh, I see. Um, okay, yeah. It just seemed very moony. Yeah, with the clones. I, th- I found it interesting, too, that because the whole clone thing to me was, was, was retarded a little bit. Yeah. Because they were cloning him as an adult. And the clones were retaining memories. What the fuck's up with yeah, that? That's, that's bizarre. Yeah. A, lot how, of, a lot of the science in it was sketchy. How would the clone not, retain a memory? Come on. Not, not wanting to plug our enemies, but there's a, a certain skeptical podcast that ripped it to shreds <laughs> this week. Like scientifically just said it was just all over the shop. Not as bad as Prometheus, but certainly um, bad when it comes to the science. Like they said, the moon would have just coalesced in again and it wouldn't have if you blew up the moon the way they did yeah. or the the gravity of it would still be there so it wouldn't have it wouldn't have had the devastating effect with all the tsunamis and everything because the the, the gravitational pull of the moon was would still be affecting the earth in the same way even though the moon had been, been supposedly blown. exploded ah, so interesting yeah. but anyway right so out of 10 then uh out of 10 o- overall i'd probably give it like maybe a 7 I gave it six point seven. Okay. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> I couldn't decide between six and seven and six yeah. and a half, but yeah, six point seven. I thought. Yeah, about about a seven. I give it. Yeah, because yeah. it was it was it was a cool two hours. You know, it wasn't horrible. I didn't walk out of the theater thinking, "Well, that was a waste of two hours of my life." Yeah, same. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah. So next yeah. up is Iron Man. Are you going to go see Iron Man? Nah, I'm not not really interested in those kind of films. I watched the first one and uh, it was all right. So yeah. I, I loved the first one. I thought the first one was great. Hated the second one. Hated I, Iron Man two. I, I wanted to fucking, I wanted to stick needles in my eyes. It was it was horrible. I, I might have seen it. I don't even know. I'm not like with um, Captain America and Superman and all that. I've lost interest in that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the, the next one I want to go and see is World War Z or World War Z, Z. which is obviously the pun on World War Three. See, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm not, I'm not into that, dude. I think that looks look like a fucking joke. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's what everyone says, but I think it looks awesome. I just love zombies and stuff. I never used to, but then after 28 Days Later, that, yeah, got me into that was the good. Stuff. I like 28 Days Later. Yeah. But and obviously, know. The Walking Dead now. Yeah, Walking I'm Dead is the bomb. Really into. But I don't know. We'll 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 we'll, uh, we'll see. I guess how it plays out. I I, I have a feeling it's going to suck. But hey, what do I know? Uh, we'll see. Maybe yeah. I'll mention it once I go and see it yeah. in a month or so. Um, so what happened with the Linux experiment then? Did you do anything more with that? Uh, no, it's still still running on my MacBook. I haven't erased it. Um, I haven't really booted into my MacBook for the last week. So so no, I, unfortunately, I haven't. Oh, so you didn't get a chance to see if you're. Um, analog to digital recording. No, no, I d- I'll I'll do it for next week for sure. I'll plug it in and and, and try and record something. Um, I did install um, what's it called Audacity. Oh yeah, 
and I, I looked around at that, and uh, this is not Marvel, a bad... marveled at its beauty. Yeah, it's ugly as fuck, but but it, it's pretty functional. It's got a lot of stuff yeah, it's, on it's it. Yeah, it's really functional. It's a good good program. Yeah, yeah. but it's it could do with a facelift. Totally, but uh, but yeah, I mean the uh, the 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 mechanics of it is uh, is pretty cool. There's a lot of cool function in there. You can do all kinds of shit with it. Um, so yeah, I installed that, and uh, I play around with that with a little bit. I did record myself talking into the computer's microphone, and, okay. uh, and that worked. <laughs> I just didn't plug my uh, my analog to digital interface into the USB port to see if it yeah. would work. I I, w- I would assume that it will work, but uh, but I'll have to test well, it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't assume too much until you tried it. Yeah, you never know. If it's oh, it depends how old it is and how popular it is. Yeah. Um, and whether the drivers made it into the kernel. Well, we'll see. I'll, I'll try it next week for a uh, full show. <laughs> All right, should we, uh, should we do some news? Yeah, let's do it. Mind Tech Podcast, Episode 9. Here comes the news. All right, here's, here's one that, that popped onto our radar screens uh, this week, and uh, it's kind of disturbing, but it's, it, it's kind of echoing what we've all suspected for, for many, many years, and that is, um, are all telephone calls recorded and accessible to the U.S. government? A former FBI counterterrorism agent claims on CNN that this is the case. The real capabilities and behavior of the U.S. surveillance state are almost entirely unknown to the American public because, like most things of significance done by the U.S. government, it operates behind an impenetrable wall of secrecy. But it seems... But a seemingly spontaneous admission this week by former FBI counterterrorism agent provides a rather startling acknowledgement of just how vast and invasive these surveillance activities really are. Um, so, Joe, this is something that we've talked about many times, not only on the Mind Tech podcast, but on the Mindset podcast. Um, but it's always been in terms of a suspicion as to what they're doing. In other words, they must be doing this. This must be happening. Yeah, like when we were talking about CISPO, you said um, when you worked for an ISP, some guys turned up just after 9-11 and right. installed some boxes and exactly. whatever. So, you know, we, but, but it is, it's just a suspicion. We, we, we assume that they're, they're doing all this stuff. There's no concrete uh, evidence out there. Uh, but now this guy, uh, and, and I don't know if you've watched the clip at all on CNN when he's talking about it, um, he starts talking about it, then kind of catches himself, and then he's like, um, well, well, we'll see kind of thing. And try to think as if in his mind he's like, oh, shit, maybe I shouldn't have said that. All right. Um, uh, but, yeah, he, he, he alluded to the fact that uh, the U.S. government uh, records all communications, uh, you know, telephone, email, uh, you know, all digital communication, everything is uh, recorded. And then, you know, through data mining techniques, um, they can go through all that, the, those vast terabytes or petabytes or however the fuck much, much information they have and very quickly pull up uh, a very, very detailed uh, view of who you are, what you do, what you're into, where you live, what you had for breakfast yesterday, and so on and so on. Um. I find this a little disturbing. Well, it's not really disturbing to me because it's, it, there's no, it's not news to me. It's, it was obvious. We talked about it with the CISPA thing. They, they're trying to legitimize it, it and make it so they can use well, this in court and whatever. I, I hear what you're saying. It, it is obvious and it is something that we've sus- suspected for many years, but it's, it's a little bit like, you know, um, scientists talking about extraterrestrial life. You know, well, the probability is that the universe is teeming with life and life is everywhere and there are vast civilizations. You know, that's the probability. And, it's you know, they're thinking that way. But if a spaceship lands tomorrow morning, it's a little bit different. Yeah, and, I suppose, yeah. And, and it's the same thing with this. You know, we suspect all this. It's very likely. It's probably happening. But then finally to get some kind of admission that this really is happening kind of paints it in a slightly different light. You know, it's something that we've always suspected, but to have this guy kind of inadvertently admit that, oh, yeah, <laughs> this really is going on. Yeah, and he, he said that they use it 
they can't use it in court or anything, but no, we use it to catch people. And and then they use probably fucking torture and God knows what to get the actual evidence that they can use yeah. against people. But it, this is just what we've all suspected f- from the beginning, pretty much. That right. if, if anything is out there that they can intercept, they're going to intercept it and store it in massive data centers. And, and they might not use it for for 10 years and it might be a case of they don't actually mine through that data but then if you do something else like right. supposing you set a bomb off then they'll go through everything that you've done and find if you've got if there's anything else they can pin on you yeah exactly it's it's uh once you you know 99 percent of the population are not going to be on their radar at all but all of their data is going to be um cataloged and harvested um but if you do something to get on their radar um, even if it's something kind of trivial, if if you pop up, they can then run a detailed search into everything you've done for the last, I don't know, depending how far they go back, five, ten years, who knows, and uh, pull up a surprisingly highly detailed and accurate picture of who you are, what you do, what you're into, everything, like a crazy accurate picture, mm. and, and and use that against you. Yeah, it's like with the, anyone who was involved in any way with communism, they they track them and bug their phones. And I'm sure that anyone who says anything about um, being into uh, anarchism, right. if that's a word, or, you know, communism or anything that goes against the norm, I'm sure those people are, oh, sure. are on, on the watch list. And but I, as you say, 99 point whatever. Uh, they're not, they're not going to be go on the radar, work right. and that's they're, it. they're just living regular lives. You know, they're not, they're not uh, you know, and even if they do hold these beliefs, I'm, I'm sure they have like um, uh, an assessment um, chart or something where they'd say, you know, this person thinks this way, believes this, but the likelihood, likelihood of him or her actually doing this is this percentage. You know what I mean? Like if, like if they were to look at me, they they they'd see that you know I have all these beliefs and ideas and thoughts and everything, but the likelihood of me actually hurting somebody or blowing shit up is like you know zero. You know, that kind of thing. yeah. I suppose yeah. I'm, I'm sure the likes of Alex Jones, if he isn't working for them, <laughs> ooh, controversial. <laughs> um, I'm sure he's on the the list getting everything that he emails and. Well, he's, oh, he's he's way out in the public, though. It's not like he's just a private citizen who's into this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's he's way out there in the public, and he he has no uh, uh, no fear of of uh, of presenting his beliefs and or thoughts in a very public manner. So it's 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 very difficult, very different for for him. What would be interesting to for for, for him would be to to find out, you know, if his public persona is very different from his private persona. Uh, that would be, um, interesting. You know, he's, he's, he's out there publicly ranting and raving about the new world order and all this stuff when privately, uh, you know, obviously he's paying taxes to the government. He's, he's running a legitimate business. He's not being that radical. Well, yeah, exactly. When you really look at it, I mean, this is getting way off topic, but his his business is pretty mainstream, isn't it? He's, as you say, he's paying loads of tax and right. and being a really straight up businessman. I'm sure, sure he's got accountants and yeah, all the absolutely. rest of it. I'm sure that if if they were to look at his accounting and his books and what he, he would be, it, all the 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 i's would be dotted and the t's would be crossed and everything would be perfect there'd be no issues and the the government would or the irs would look at it and say okay thank you mr jones have a nice day and that would be the end of that because everything is is uh, legitimate and above board uh but publicly he's uh, the, the new world order 9-11 inside job. he's ranting about this stuff but privately he's just he's a businessman mm. um i mean there's many, a very successful businessman at that well yeah i mean there's many rumors i mean how accurate these rumors are i don't know that, that his business nets around 20 million dollars a year generates around 20 million you know which which is uh which is a nice chunk of change for somebody sitting at a microphone ranting uh, about uh, how fucked up the government is mm. um you know and, and it's it's that is, is is a rarity because once you get into these topics i mean making money is is not uh, something that uh 
<laughs> that leaps out at you. You know, there's a lot more lucrative businesses to get involved in rather than uh, talking about topics such as, uh, you know, para- parapolitical stuff and things like that. Uh, usually the money that you make from there is, is called uh, surviving money. You make enough to survive <laughs> pretty much, yeah, you exactly. know. You get one or two people like David Icke and Alex Jones, but then there's a lot more people with right. blogs but they're, they're, YouTube they're, they're a tiny minority, you know. They're, they're uh, kind of the... Uh, uh, at, at the the far reaches, you know, the people that that actually do make a living. You know, everyone else is either surviving or making nothing. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, right, before we get too far down that, should move on to the next one. Okay. Um, which is operator of Germany's Torrent TO gets prison sentence amid piracy crackdown. A German court sentences the operator of the file sharing site to nearly four years in prison, one of the toughest ever punishments for internet piracy. Uh, this is in Cologne, Germany. A German court has handed down one of the toughest ever sentences for internet piracy, convicting the 33-year-old for, of file sharing. Uh, sorry, 33-year-old operator of file sharing site Torrent.to to three years and ten months in prison for copyright infringement. While the ruling is not yet final, the district court in Aachen is also. Uh, also issued an arrest warrant for the subject who is under investigation for a breach of trust and fraudulent bankruptcy, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, is he actually hosting and sharing the files? Well, it's this old chestnut again. Yeah, I mean, um, that's, that's uh, I, I don't get it. Although this article did bring up, the, the next bit it says, uh, the court suspects he may have trans... Uh, transferred the ill-gotten gains from advertising on torrent.to said to be a large five-digit monthly sum to accounts in Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Okay. Um, so what? Now, I've never really thought about this before, but if you're profiting from a BitTorrent site... Oh, I see. Okay. See, that's what they've busted them for. Gotcha. If he was just running a little community and, and right, it was right. just surviving on donations or whatever, it was just breaking even. Yeah. But the fact is that he was making... Pretty good money by the sounds of things. Right. Putting, From putting the ads up and ads, stuff. Yeah. On a site that was just there to, to serve torrent um, mm. files. Interesting. But then again, he's, he's not, I mean, he, he's not running a server hosting all these files and sharing them with people. Exactly. I mean, this is like the Pirate Bay thing. It's not, right. it's not like Mega Upload where, he, where exactly. Kim.com actually was right. hosting the, right. the wares. Now, if if see this this is the double standard here because I mean if if you're gonna put this guy in jail for uh, hosting essentially a search engine for people to search for for uh, for torrent files which he is not hosting, then you know you should really uh, put uh, Google in jail too because you. Can well, the do- only difference with that is that Google is not hosting the torrent files on their server. But they're, they? but they're pointing to where the torrent files are. They're, they're showing you where they are. Yeah, yeah. You t- it's, you take, exactly. It's not difficult. You could put in, you know, any movie, Jurassic Park, whatever. <laughs> it, yeah, and, totally. But, and, and you can find and, it. And you'll enter Google a Jurassic Park torrent, and then you'll, you'll get all three or four or whatever movies. Yeah, and, you know, in Blu-ray quality. Mm. And it's uh, not, uh, as you say, yeah. Google don't get in trouble for that, and yet this guy does. So it doesn't make sense to yeah. me. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not some legal expert. I don't know. Maybe I'm way off. But it, it, to me, that doesn't make sense. This guy's going to go to prison for doing something that Google does every day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just just go. I mean, it's almost uh, links back to the, the previous one. When you get to the size of Google and with their Gmail and all the rest of it, they they must be in the pockets of the the lawmakers and right. the powers that be plus and google so, plus plus this is just some dude google yeah. google can shit lawyers yeah you know exactly. they 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 can pull lawyers out of their ass 24/7 and not just some some you know retard who just graduated law school law school yesterday you know serious hardcore know their shit lawyers so i mean it's a different deal it's always easy to go after like the little guy you know that's easy Oh, well, this yeah. little 33 year old just, yeah, let's fuck him. Let's make an example out of him. Yeah, we should go after Google too. They're doing this too. Yeah, we can't go after them because they'll throw so much fucking legal bullshit our way. We'll be tied up for years and we'll never get nothing done. Whereas this guy, oh, we, can, we can knock this guy out in two seconds. All right, let's go after him. Boom. 
Mm. I, I couldn't help but notice he was 33 years old, though. Yeah, I know. 33. <laughs> 33. I just, when you know about that, you just see it everywhere. everywhere but it's, yeah. it's probably a coincidence. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's um, double standards. You know, it's uh, it's crazy. All right, let's see what else we got going on here. Uh, one year later, the results of uh, Tor Books UK, and they're going DRM free. Uh, Tor Books UK announced that it was making all of its ebooks DRM free. Uh, there's still a lot of debate and interest in the topic. And uh, this person there, Julie Crisp, she re- recently wrote a piece about the subject in Publicus Weekly. Um, and Tor is saying that they made the decision in conjunction with our sister company in the U.S. for our shared brand imprint that it was something that we've been exploring for quite a while. And now we felt committed to our particular er- area. Uh, for those who don't know what DRM is, it's a copy protection or access control to digital content that applies to ebooks. Many publishers and retailers use it as a complex and controversial issue of copyright holders uh, and uh, consumers with passionate arguments for and against. Um, I think this is a good thing. I think uh, making uh, ebooks DRM free is is very much a good thing. Yeah, I mean, this is quite a long rambling article. Yeah. Um, but the the upshot of it is that a year ago they announced that they were going DRM free and stripped all of their titles of DRM and just put them out. And it, the the long and the short of this article is that it hasn't impacted sales uh, in any way at all, really. Right. And I, uh, I I don't think it would. I mean, if um, D- DRM for me, it, it, all DRM does is it makes things inconvenient for customers. That's that's mm. that's bottom line. It it makes it makes in, the the products inconvenient for customers to use. Um, as far as copying, DRM does nothing. Does nothing. I mean, if if I'm a hardcore core pirater and I'm out there copying and pirating stuff, and I come across a file that has DRM, what do I care? I don't give a shit. I strip the DRM out and I'm on, on my way. Right. Yeah, exactly. There's always a way to get rid of yeah, DRM if you really, really want to. Of course. It's, it's, it can be a pain in the ass, but it's there's always a way. But for uh, for average customers, oh, look at this movie, look at this book, oh, I want to buy this, and they buy it, and then DRM is, is, it becomes a hassle, it becomes a pain in the ass. Um, a, few, a few days ago, I wanted to make um, a screen grab of a movie, and I... Uh, the the only thing left on, on on iTunes as far as media with DRM is movies and TV shows. If you purchase a movie or a TV show, it, it's riddled with fucking DRM. Uh, they got the DRM out of the music a couple of years ago, but but the movies and stuff still has it. And I purchased a movie a couple of years ago called War Games. I don't know if you're familiar with this old classic '80s movie about computer hackers with Matthew. Yeah, Robert. yeah, classic movie. Yeah, yeah, it's a great movie. And uh, I, I I have it. I bought it on iTunes. And I wanted to get a screenshot of his uh, Imzadi computer that he used for hacking. And I wanted to take a look at it. So, oh, I'll watch the movie, and I'll take a screenshot of the computer. So I got the movie on. I'm watching the movie, and it comes up to the scene where the uh, the screenshot. So I'm like, okay. So I hit my key combination, kachik, make a screenshot. And then I open up the um, the PNG file of the screenshot, and it's all transparent. There's no image of the uh, of the video because DRM now if if I'd had the DVD of war games and I'd ripped the DVD it'd be no problem I can make screenshots till the fucking cows come home but the DRM prevents me from doing that the same token if I, if I took that that DRM file of war games and I wanted to play it on my Android device or something ain't gonna happen sorry gotta have iTunes and all I can think of is, wait a second, I paid you for this. I gave you money for this file. I should be able to do whatever, whatever the fuck I want. I paid for it. Well, this goes back to the thing we were talking about before, the thing that you don't seem to be able to want to accept, and that is that when you buy a CD or a DVD, you are buying a physical thing, whereas if you buy anything digital, and this is the biggest con that they've managed to get away with, you're not buying the thing, you are buying a license to use that thing. So say it's a movie, yeah. you, uh, you, you didn't buy the movie War Games, you bought a license to watch that movie. It's almost like you rented it yeah. rather than Crazy. bought it. 
and, and that is how they've they've managed to get away with putting DRM in because it's only a license to use that thing rather than if you buy if you'd bought a DVD of or if it's on Blu-ray whatever then you can do with that what you want right yeah I mean it it, it boils down to uh, you know convenience you know I mean I, I I don't remember the exact circumstances when I bought War Games but it was probably something like oh look there's War Games I haven't seen that for years I'd like to watch it click ten bucks boom Right, mm. you know. Whereas otherwise, I'd be jumping in the car, driving to a store, or get it off Amazon, or, or wait, a and wait, wait a couple of days. Whereas if you get it on the, it's instant. You know, and because you're buying it legitimately, you know the quality is going to be awesome. It's not going to be some shitty, you know, copy. It's going to be crisp, clear, killer quality. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm more than willing. I, I love buying stuff from iTunes and Amazon and shit. You know, buying music and and, and over the internet. It's the greatest. It's, it's convenient. The quality's good. You know, it's awesome. But but then when you start running into these these little brick walls, it just becomes a hassle. You know, it's like God damn it, enough. Yeah, it's DRM just drives people to piracy. I think. Yeah, it, you're probably right. Yeah, I would agree. It, it's all about what, whatever the easiest way to do it for most people. You, you know what? You know what started? I mean, I didn't do this, but you know what popped into my mind? Like I, I tried making the screen grab, and then suddenly I'm, I'm, I started obsessing about the screen grab. <laughs> right, I gotta get. How the fuck am I gonna do this? And then I thought, oh, you know, I'll torrent the movie. I'll download it. And then I'm like, wait a second. I got the movies right here. I bought it. I paid for the goddamn thing. And now I'm gonna get a, an illegal copy just so I can make a screenshot. Or I'm gonna exactly. or I'm gonna jump in the car and, and, and drive to a store and buy the DVD. Cause I, I mean, this is this is lunacy. Well, as I say, it's it's a con that they have managed to get away with, and. Uh, until people wake up to that and stop buying things that are just a license to use it, then, then they're going to keep getting away with it. Yeah, they got it. They got it. I mean, this what tour, these, the tour books are doing, I think, is, is commendable. And, and the sooner people you know, do this and, and dump the DRM, it, it, it's, uh, all the DRM does is just screw with, with regular customers, with honest regular customers. Uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're into copying and piracy, DRM doesn't mean shit. Mm. Well, as Richard Storman calls it, digital restrictions management. Yeah, it is, and it is. It, it, it totally is uh, restrict. It is very, very restrictive. Exactly. All right, uh, let's uh, take a quick break, and we'll be right back with our main feature. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is Gareth from uh, MindsetCentral.com. Uh, just coming on really quickly to talk to you about subscribing or donating to Mindset Central. Um, right now, we average about 17 brand new podcasts a month on Mindset Central, and that's for free. So you get that content for free. It always has been free. And it will continue to be free. But uh, just take a moment to imagine the time and the effort it takes to put all that together. Plus also creating, building, sustaining the website and the server costs. Um, we're constantly finding ourselves reaching the point that, uh, that sometimes is the breaking point. And uh, we're, we're up against that old foe of time and money. And we're hoping that with your help, we can break through this wall. Not only do we want to continue with Mindset Central, but we want to build upon it and create something very special on the Internet. So please think about helping us and becoming a subscriber. By becoming a subscriber to Mindset Central, you'll have access to the subscriber section, which provides exclusive, all-new podcasts and a lot more. The subscriber section has and will continue to grow into an area that you will want to be a part of. And with monthly access priced at that of a, a large coffee at Starbucks. So for one coffee, you get access to the subscriber section. Packed with content, content that is continually added to on a weekly basis. So please help us. Help us by becoming a subscriber. Thank you. And we're back. 
Nine Tech Podcast, Episode 9. We're back from the break, and now we're going to talk about the Raspberry Pi. And we're not talking about some cool pie that you buy at Marie Callender's. We're talking about the computing device. The computing device, which um, I find fascinating for a number of reasons. But the main thing that pops in my mind about the Raspberry Pi, especially that it's Model A and Model B, is that this, this harkens back to good old Acorn computers and the old BBC Micro. <laughs> you know? How, in what sense? Well, uh, because it's based on um, ARM architecture and ARM, the, the whole ARM processor was created and invented by Acorn computers in the late 80s who did the BBC Micro. Uh-huh. I see. I didn't know that. And the fact that it's uh, Model A and Model B, it, it, it really does harken. Because when, when the BBC Micro came out in, like, the mid-'80s, there was a Model A and a Model B. And Model B was the one to have because that, that was the shit because that one had 32K, <laughs> whereas the uh, the Model A only had 16K. But you could upgrade it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we should start from the start, I suppose. Yeah. Um, w- what is a Raspberry Pi? Uh, well, it's a, a credit card-sized computer, pretty much, um, and it's it runs a Broadcom system on a chip, which means it's uh, the the CPU and the RAM and the graphics card are all one unupgradable chip, basically. Right. Um, and it runs an old version of ARM, though ARM v6, which is not what you have got in um, in a current smartphone. Like right. my Nexus Four is not. ARM v6, um, and it's yeah, it's it's pretty much just a little computer, well, a tiny computer. But it's it's, that, it's kind of it's um, it's old technology. Now, when, when I say old, it's not like old technology, but it's a few years old. But yeah. but it's uh, it's so small and so cheap, and it's it's targeted towards hobbyists, right? I mean, you know, the, the regular people are not going to buy this. It's only people that are, like, into technology and what they can make it do are going to be very, very curious and into the Raspberry Pi. Well, um, the reason it's called the Raspberry Pi, and that is P-I as in the the number, 3.14, whatever, um, is because of Python, which is a, a relatively simple programming language. Um and they, they needed a fruit because they wanted to be like, well, jokingly, like Apple. Like everything's named after a fruit. So that's why right. they called it Raspberry Pi. And it was originally aimed at school children. Ah, okay. The idea being that they it was a cheap way to get school tr- children into programming. See, it's even, even more like the BBC Micro then. Mm. Even more. Because back in the day, that that was the uh, the educational computer in in British schools from like 1980 to 1990. If if you went to a computer class in the UK, chances are you were going to be sitting at an Acorn computer of some kind. Yeah. Oh yeah, we had them at school. Yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at the BBC Micro now. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sure we had that. Yeah. Anyway, um, so it was originally aimed at ch- at school children. Um, but it hasn't really worked out that way. It sort of has in a sense, but as you say, it's become more of a sort of hobbyist geeks computer. Um, and because it runs an ARM processor rather than um, an Intel x86, you can't run any old usual operating system. So, for example, you can't run Windows on it. Not that you would want to, but you can't run yeah. it or, or Mac OS X. Right. Um, you can only run Linux and similar operating systems on it um for for example uh debian which is what ubuntu is based on arch and risk os which is not linux but that's a different thing they're officially supported um it, interesting that ubuntu is not officially supported on it because ubuntu don't support the older version of arm yeah although they they do support newer versions of arm um see the, the, the... so this is amazing to me because you know I, I was kind of semi kidding around about the Acorn BBC thing, but now you're mentioning Risk OS, yeah, which was also uh, created by Acorn in in the mid to late '80s for their Archimedes uh, uh, computers, which was one of the first consumer computers that ran on PowerPC. Was the, the yeah? Well, that, that's why they, someone ported it because it's obviously ran on similar yeah architecture, right? So it, it wasn't that difficult to port 
Risk OS to the to Raspberry Pi. Um, and it's very cheap as well. There's, there's two models, the Model A and the Model B, as you mentioned. Right. Um, and the Model A is only £24 delivered yeah. in the UK. Uh, and the Model B is £30 delivered. Yeah. Um, it, it's roughly around that over here, too. I think we're talking about $30, $40 for, uh, for the, or 35 bucks for, this, for yeah. the same thing. Um, here, here's what I find interesting about this, though, dude, is that... Um, the Raspberry Pi has only really started to kind of get onto people's radar over here in the United States or, or starting to become popular. I mean, well, maybe popular is too strong of a word, but starting to appear uh, in the last four or five months. Which I find really interesting because really, um, as soon as it came out, in fact, prior to launch, there was a big buzz about it in the UK. It was on the mainstream news. It was it was a really big deal, and they sold just they, they sold out straight away, and it was yeah. really difficult to get hold of one. Um, so that that's interesting that it hasn't really taken off. There. Yeah, just in the last maybe four, maybe maybe six months, maybe in the last six months, has it really started to uh, pop into the public's uh, consciousness over here, and people are buying them and fooling around with them and and uh, seeing what they can do with them. Now, I don't know whether that was because of the, you know a distribution model; it was hard to get hold of them, you know. Uh, you know, being shipped from the UK or whatever, I, I don't know. But now it's it's you, you can get them fairly easily. You know, you can go on Amazon and purchase them, or okay, or walk into Fry's and buy one. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's only in the last maybe four four to six months has it really started to to catch on over here. Because they were originally made in the Far East. I'm not sure exactly what country. Um, China, poss- I think it was China. Um, but then recently they moved the factory to Wales, of all places. Yeah. Um, and so they're now being made in the UK. So that that would make sense that they, it was hard to distribute them there because of shipping costs and everything. Right, but they've right. obviously got in place distribution deals now to get them. Uh, it's interesting that you can go into a shop. Fries is that? Um, I, Fr- I suppose a bit like Maplin. Yeah. Fries is uh, is the bomb, dude. Fry if if you're into technology, Fries is the shit. It's it's. It's and you know I should I should go to my local fries and and film it because I, I think your jaw would drop. It, it's it's a huge warehouse that sells nothing but electronic stuff. So it's all cables and cables, switches, processors, motherboards, RAM, PC, oh, okay. it, like you you name it. It's it's unbelievable. Do they sell um, laptops and TVs and stuff as well? Yep, laptops, TV, even washing machines, books, DVDs, Blu-rays, anything to do with consumer electronics. And it's not this, – this thing is huge. It's the size of a football field. It's huge. Yeah. And they got everything in there, everything you can imagine, and, and at really, really good deals. The only oh, caveat right. about going to Fry's, I've found, is that when you go there, you got to know what you want. Or, because if you ask a sales assistant, hey, do you have the latest this? Or do you, they, you're, you're talking to a mental case. They, they, they're going to be clueless. Now, that, that's not to say that, that they're all, you know, there are obviously some very uh, uh, on the ball uh, sales associates at Fry's, but, but they're, they're in the minority. Most people, you ask them a question, you might as well be talking to the fucking wall. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of like most shops really in Britain. Yeah, they don't have a clue what they're selling. They're just well, it's usually just young kids. I sound right. so old saying that, but you know, sort of they have no idea. Uh, yeah. Late teens just don't give a fuck about the job. Just only doing it for some beer money or whatever. Right. So yeah, but it's a great if you know what you want. It's it's a great store. Yeah, you just go there and, and you get great deals on any anything. You know. Anything. If if you wanted to build a PC and you knew what parts you needed, you could just show up with the list and walk out with every component you needed. Well, and it's com- competitive against internet they, prices. Then, they they, uh, they they match prices. So if you say, "Hey, look, I saw this motherboard motherboard on Amazon for uh, for eighty bucks, and you're selling it for ninety five, they'll pull up the website, so you see that it's eighty bucks. Say, okay, you got it for eighty bucks. Boom. Hmm. Well, before we do them any more free advertising, let's <laughs> move on. <laughs> the, the, I'll just say the main reason they do that is because th- there's a lot of uh, people, like if you're going to buy a TV, you go to a TV store, you examine yeah. the TV, make sure it's what you want, and then you pull out your smartphone and buy, buy it on Amazon, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're trying to comp- combat that by doing internet price matching. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know how it's not a very sustainable business model, I don't suppose. But yeah, probably you know. not, but yeah. All right, so so um, the Raspberry Pi. Now you have one of these things, right? You purchased yes, one. Yes. It's in my hand now, yes. Did you get a case for it and everything? Nah. I never bothered bothered with that really. So you just have like the bare circuit board thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing that we should mention that yeah. it's I say computer, it's basically just a circuit board with some connections on it. Um and uh, yeah, there's, it's, there's no hard drive. It, there's, it doesn't come with a, a screen or a mouse or a keyboard or anything like that. It's just, it, or it doesn't even come with a power supply. But it's it's powered by just a phone charger. So if um, if you've got a, a normal, I think micro USB phone charger, so you can't obviously use an Apple yeah. iPhone one. But um, if you've got an Android phone, then you can use the charger for that. Or otherwise, you can get a charger pretty cheap. So it's very um, low power. Very, very low power. Yeah, it's uh, the uh, the Model A, which has only got one USB port and it's got no Ethernet port, um, only uses 2.5 watts. And the uh, the Model B, which has got two USB ports and an Ethernet port um, and more RAM, uh, uses 3.5 watts. So it's really, really just a tiny, tiny amount of power. All right. It's so easy. let me get this straight. So, so just to kind of paint a mental image for our listeners, it's it's a small circuit board about the size of, uh, well, a credit card. It's a little bit bigger than the yeah. credit card, but but and uh, on there you have USB ports, um, HDMI out. Okay, what else you got on there? You got the uh, audio. Out. Yeah, you got an audio out. Obviously, you can send audio out via HDMI if you right. plug it into a TV. Yeah. Um, it's also got a component video, which is uh, an RCA connector. Like video out? Kind of yeah, like, a, like phono is what some people would call right. that. You know, when yeah. you have the, the yellow, the red, and the white. Gotcha, yeah. Yeah, like old analog. But uh, it doesn't have VGA out, though, interestingly. All right. So you've got to get some kind of an adapter if you want to connect it to a VGA monitor. Yeah, or you've got to have something that has, it, that has HDMI or some sort of adapter. Okay. So... Um, and it, it doesn't have a hard drive. Instead, it uses an SD card. Like um, a standard so slide, SD card slots in there? Yeah, you, you, standard SD card slots in. So um, uh, so would the SD card be the main boot drive that you would install your operating system on? Yes. Okay. Now, you can't, unlike most other computers, you can't plug in a CD drive and then install it to the to the, the SD card. You have to plug the SD card into another computer right. and, and copy, well, flash it with an image basically okay. um which isn't just a case of copying it you have to use uh well uh, in linux it's trivial it's just dd is the um the command line tool but you can get graphical programs that will do it and so you copy the the image onto it anyway and then you put it in plug your power supply in and, and then it, it, it boots up now with the uh the the usb port on there i'm assuming that you can connect uh, an external usb hard drive to it right Yes. Now, the problem is because it's so low power and only using a phone charger, um, if you start plugging in too much uh, in the way of USB stuff, yeah. uh, the, the power will just go out and it'll stop. It, uh, it'll just reboot itself. So, so, you, so you, you plug in a USB keyboard and a USB mouse. Yeah. And then you get the HDMI out going into, say, a TV. Yeah. You can, you can fire it up and you're in Linux. Yes. But they, they recommend that you use a powered USB hub, you know, a right, USB hub right. that has uh, its own power supply. Gotcha. And, and then you can plug in, um, hard drive obviously, with a hub. Stuff. Yeah. The, the problem with USB, not to get too technical, but the, the Ethernet port, it, the, the, the Raspberry Pi basically has one USB hub on it. And, and on the Model B, that is split between two USB ports and the Ethernet jack. So there's no gigabit Ethernet or, right. or even close to that. It's not even 100 megabit Ethernet. Um, because it's being shared with the USB, right. it means that the it's network slow. is very slow on it. So if you, if you install um, Linux with like a desktop environment and you fire up, um, I don't know, Firefox, can you yeah. surf the web with it? Or is it, or is it jittery or slow? Or how, what's, you what's you the... can try, but no, it's, it's painful. Okay. If the, the, the only operating system that I've successfully managed to boot on this thing is debian and debian is what underpins ubuntu and i'm pretty well versed with it and you can install 
uh, most of the standard programs that you can on a, on a desktop Debian on this thing. Right. But as you say, you boot it up, and it's it, by default it uses the LXDE desktop, which is quite a lightweight desktop. Okay. Um, but it's it's unusable, basically, is the bottom line. Well, that, as a desktop operating system, it kind of de- well. <laughs> see, that kind of defeats the purpose, then, right? I mean, what well, you, not really. What are you going to use it for? Well, that that's the thing. If you try and use it just as a general purpose computer to go on Facebook and YouTube, it's not going to work. It's, it's just hopeless. Yeah, I mean, you can if you're willing to wait ages for things to render and right. whatever. Um, but it's it, that is not what it was designed for. It was designed for either a, a very lightweight environment for kids to learn a bit of basic programming in okay. with Python or for hobbyists to put in robots and stuff. Oh, uh, okay. I got you. Um, now, I, I saw online um, a while ago um, some people had made a, a media center with, yes. with it. And um, you could install the, uh, the was it the X, XM uh, BC the yeah. the Xbox Media Center yeah XBMC um, yeah and uh, and it runs really well until you try playing back a movie yeah now the thing is it does the system on a chip that it's based on does have hardware decoding support for certain codecs and they they've now uh, arranged licenses where you can buy uh, unlock codes for those codecs. So you can, if you're willing to pay, it's only a couple of quid yeah. or a couple of dollars. Um, you can then unlock the um, the codex and and use hardware decoding and play back, well, supposedly 1080p video. Using like smoothly? It. Well, supposedly. I've seen demos of it, but I'm not going to pay anymore you see, <laughs> to but, check but, it out. But for the, for the price point, for what you're getting there... Um, you could make a really nice media center, right? You put the Xbox media center on there. You get a cool case for it. You plug the HDMI into your TV. You connect a, a big hard drive to it via USB. Uh, maybe uh, hook up uh, some kind of remote control. And if it can play back those movies, you have a really cool media center for 60 bucks. Yeah, pretty much. You know, which yeah. is nothing. And I, I find yeah, well, that very attractive. Well, when you look at it that way, yeah. Um, but I, I haven't. I, I tried to get Xbox Media Center working on it, and and I couldn't couldn't make it work. I mean, I was I was gonna. I've tried to structure some notes, and it, we're kind of going a bit all over the place. But um, the the problem I have is I've I've only got two screens with HDMI in. Uh, one of them is my 27-inch LG monitor, which I use for my desktop, okay. um, which obviously doesn't have any speakers or anything. It's just a computer monitor. Right, right. Um, and the the other one I've got is a 15-inch TV that was made just around the time HDMI came out. So it's just got HDMI in it. Okay. Um, and on both of those, I I have tried everything with editing config files and and on commenting things in the config files and all the rest of it and i cannot get proper resolution and aspect ratio and not have a blackboard around it and stuff like that i just cannot get it to work with yeah. those two monitors so it's it's definitely a um a hobbyist uh, machine then uh, for for regular people this is something that they want to stay away from well yeah i mean the thing is i don't claim to be a linux expert but i'm pretty well versed with standard things like Zubuntu and you know Debian right. and making making them work, um, but but even I struggled with this. To I'm sure if I'd spent loads of time and loads of done loads of research and all the rest of it, I could have made it work perfectly and and all the rest of it. But it's I'm not that much of a hobbyist, basically. So basically, if 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 you have the time and the inclination, you you can really make this little thing do probably a ton of stuff uh but yeah yeah because it, it has these pins on it as well that i didn't mention um and those pins can be connected to all sorts of external peripherals um and you can if if you know about programming <coughs> you can you program an operating system to to interface with these pins with whatever these peripherals are cameras 
uh, robotic arms, wheels, whatever, and you can use it um, to, to control robots and stuff. Yeah. Um, the someone sent a balloon and a sort of semi-autonomous balloon up way, way high, like uh, to the point where you could. It was taking pictures of the Earth and space in the same yeah, picture, yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, using it, um, and it has niche applications like that, basically. Right. But the the problem with that is that there are better things f- for that job. For example, the Beagle board and Arduinos. Um, the, there's a, a relatively new thing that's got a Kickstarter called Sparky. All that stuff's more expensive, though, right? Um, well, not hugely. Um, and the, the thing is that those, uh, the, the BeagleBoard and the Arduino are open source hardware. So all of the drivers and everything are completely open source for it. And, and so anyone can do anything with it. Whereas the Raspberry Pi, the idea was that it was open source. Yeah. But the, gra- the graphics dri- drivers have never truly been open sourced for it. So uh, although that you can, after a fashion, get the code for it, there are still what they call binary blobs not wishing to get too technical, but meaning, and the, 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 the long and the short of that is, it, you, co- you don't have complete control over the machine. Uh, whereas with something like the Beagle board or the Arduino, you do have complete control and you can do whatever you want with it. Mm. But the, uh, the, the thing that it's good for, I think, is, um, and I've heard people say this before, if you are a kid who is in, interested in learning how, computers work properly then your family are likely to have a, a windows 7 or windows 8 laptop and oh, um and your parents are not likely to want to let you fuck around with it basically <laughs> and and oh let me just install this and let me just install that whereas they can buy their kid this for for 30 quid or whatever yeah um and, and, if, they, can and they can plug it, apart, it into yeah. the tv with, with a usb keyboard and mouse and they can just go hog wild with it and yeah. If they fuck it up, you just reflash the SD card. Yeah, yeah. And and so it hopefully will inspire kids to to learn a bit about programming and Linux, yeah. uh, and then move on to other things. Yeah, and and definitely with the uh, the kind of um, open architecture or somewhat open, where you can actually go in there and really make it do things. You know, as 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 which is kind of. As we're rapidly moving into a, a kind of uh, era of proprietary computer models, whereas, you know, I mean, computers are appearing in everything, you know, from toasters to washing machines to whatever, but they're designed to do only one specific task, you know, and it seems like we're we're rapidly going down that road where, you know, computers will be designed to do one thing or one thing only and not anything else, whereas something like this you can make it do anything, you know, if you, if you get the time, the inclination and the imagination, uh, who knows why you can make this thing do, um, from my perspective, what I find really attractive about this is the whole media center, um, deal. Um, right now, I mean, I guess, uh, uh, I guess the next generation of raspberry, raspberry Pi, raspberry Pi two will will be, uh, you know, a lot faster, a lot more powerful, and a lot more capable of dealing with things like that. Like you say, you can run it as a desktop environment, and it does work, but it is painful. Yeah. Um, whereas something like, you know, a little box for Media Center that you just plug a hard drive in with all your movies on it and plug it into your TV, I find that very appealing. But to be fair, though, uh, I mean, well, that's depending on whether you can get the codecs working and, and stuff and get a smooth playback. Well, another problem with that, actually, is um, if you're using quite high bitrate HD content, like 1080p, it's going to struggle to get it over the network uh, fast enough. Or, you know, if you're streaming from a server or over USB fast enough, you you might find that that, that yeah, is where the bottleneck... that's going to slow down. Well, as yeah. I say, I mean, hopefully with, with the next version, those things will be remedied. You know, it, it will be beefy enough to deal with things like that. Mm. Uh, and as for how I got it, I... Um, it, this was when it was quite hard to come by, actually. I, I went to an event called OGCAMP, 
which is um, organized by Linux Outlaws primarily. Is that like Og, uh, Og Vorbis? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, that's the, the, the name of it because Og is uh, an open source alternative to MP3. Right. And it's actually better than it. And maybe maybe one day we'll put the show out in Og, but uh, who knows? Well, we could. Anyway. There's nothing stopped. I can encode it into Og, but I don't know yeah. how many people will actually download and play it. But it's You can play that on any Android phone or uh, in Linux um, and there's no restriction on it anyway. Yeah. But that's why it's called Og Camp. But, um, and it's, it's a free culture event with quite a strong emphasis on Linux and open source, but also creative commons stuff right. and, and open hardware and that sort of thing. Um, and I met Pete Lomas. He was there. And Pete Lomas is uh, the, the hardware designer of the Raspberry Pi. Oh, really? Yeah, he's quite, quite a key dude in it. Oh, cool. Kid. So he's like one of the main guys then who put it together. Yeah, yeah. And he did a talk and he was selling them basically upstairs in, in the uh, the open hardware room. And I had a chat to him and, and I tried to negotiate a deal with him, but he wasn't having it. I said, oh, God, gives it 20 quid for cash. When it's, no, it's 25 quid. It's a foundation. We're non-profit. <laughs> well, you don't ask, you don't, you yeah. don't get. Anyway, so I think it was about 25 quid. Um, but the really interesting thing that that I found was that Pete Lomas, who on his website, he says uh, that he has got a BSc and MSc degrees in computer science, in brackets, engineering. Okay. And yet he knows nothing about Linux. Not a, not a fucking clue about Linux. Like when I said to him, so really? do you just DD the image onto the card? He just looked at me like a dog that been shown a card trick. That uh, that doesn't sound right, dude. Yeah. Well, the thing is that um, he is a pure hardware enthusiast, and he's not really interested in software. But still, clearly, st- I know. It could, I mean, he's not the the main software guy or anything. Hmm. But he it is. It's very strange that uh, he was using to get the um, to get the image. The, the Debian image onto the SD cards, he was using his laptop running Windows with some proprietary imaging tool. Right. Um, whereas in Linux, it's just a, a command, basically. DD, well, you need to be root, so sudo, dd, if, and then the path to the image, and then of the path to the, the, the memory card, the SD card. And he just had no clue about that, and See, no that, clue that, about Linux. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if if you're dealing, you know, he's 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 at an open source in in, in an open source environment, he's yeah. selling uh, open source hardware, and yet he knows nothing about uh, uh, Linux or uh, you know the GNU deal. He's, he, he, that's that's bizarre. I know it's. I, I expected him to have kind of as maybe as much knowledge as you have uh, of Linux, like to be aware of it, used it a few times, but not necessarily using it every day. Right, right. Um, whereas I'm pretty sure he doesn't know about desktop environments. And, I mean, maybe he does now. This was in August of last year, August okay. of 2012. So maybe by now the, he's, he's learned a bit more about it. I mean, it had only been a few months mm. since it came out. And he's really, he's a, he's a hardware guy. You know, he knows all about how the circuits all work together and everything. Yeah. And, and I, I did speak to someone about this and they said, well, yeah, hardware guys aren't necessarily into software. They, they make all the hardware and then just give it to other people and they deal with the software Interesting. side of it. And but so you, he just goes and still, buys a laptop. And but you'd it. still think that he'd have like a kind of basic kind of, I mean, not, not not an expert, but like a basic overview of, you know, you know what I mean? Just like, oh, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. He, he, he clearly has some, I, he had, he knew how to use um, LXDE, but to be fair, that's pretty much looks like Windows XP. I right. mean, it's you, the same yeah, the deal with the start button, menu. All that stuff, right. And, and the taskbar and everything. It's it, very standard stuff. Uh, so, yeah, well, that was quite interesting. I just thought it was worth bringing up anyway. Yeah. All right, so there you have it, the Raspberry Pi, Model A and Model B. Are you listeners going to go out and buy one? If you do, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and if you've done anything, if you've got one and you've done anything interesting with it and you don't think it's pie in the sky, <laughs> haha, but um, psh, then, yeah, let us know because I'm very skeptical about it. I just not, I'm not convinced really. About it. I think that if you if you want to use it as a desktop operating system, uh, you know, a platform, then there's much much better alternatives. And if you want to be a hobbyist making robots and shit, 
then there's better alternatives for that. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how, whether it uh, it does progress if they do come out with uh, other versions, faster, you know, more beefy uh, hardware, but yeah. at, they, at the they, same kind of price point. Well, they, I don't think they're going to be able to do that. But what, one thing that I forgot to mention was that, yeah, it's aimed at school children, and, and Google uh, bought 15,000, I think, of wow. them. Uh, yeah, they donated 15,000 to school children in the UK. Well, the thing is, the Raspberry Pi is useless on its own without a screen. Yeah. And and a screen with HDMI in is not that cheap, really. Even right. for a shitty one, it's like 50 quid, maybe. Right, right. And you, you need a keyboard, a mouse, a power supply. So it's, you know, the, the costs do add up. That's when, true. When it, that's true. And if you if you're looking for every school child in the UK to have one, it's you're not looking at just that twenty five or thirty quid. Yeah, you, you're itch. looking at maybe cannibalizing hardware that you already have laying around the house, right? Mm, or, yeah, maybe. But or, the, the or it's going like, to increase the cost significantly. You know, you're going to be talking close to more more a hundred pounds or 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 hundred and fifty pounds to buy a keyboard, mouse, monitor. And the Raspberry Pi, and once you start getting into those numbers, you might think, "Well, what am I doing? Why don't I just buy a laptop or or a, a, a real desktop?" Yeah. Or what I would say is, if you want something cheap to do this sort of thing, um, uh, a second-hand early generation netbook, like for example, the the EPC was the first netbook, yeah. E nine hundred, I think it was called. Right. Right. I no. No. Sorry. No. Seven hundred one. Um, and and uh, netbooks are kind of uh, dying out now, right? They're very, very hard to come by. Whereas you know, five or six years ago, everyone was everyone was going crazy for the netbooks. Yeah, and yeah. I've I've actually got my friend basically gave me because he bought a MacBook Pro and didn't need it. Yeah. he got it while he was traveling. Uh, the uh, the original EPC seven hundred one, right? Which uh, is painfully slow to use, but it's it's actually better than a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, you can do and, a lot more. Well, you, it comes with a screen and the keyboard, and you're ready to go yeah, out, it comes, out of the box. Yeah, it but if you wanted to plug it into a screen and a keyboard, you could, yeah. you could do that. True, so true. It's, uh, you know, th- that's what I would say. If, if you are looking to get something for your child to learn Linux on, because that that um, isn't really capable of running Windows anyway, the, the old one. But if you have a look on eBay for an uh, EP, Asus EPC 701, right. I, w- I would be surprised if they were more that expensive be than a Raspberry Pi and right. much better. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so weird. Uh, we're talking about kids being into technology. It's like... Uh, when I, when I was a kid, you know, in, in the home computer boom, you know, in the mid-'80s when computers really started to catch on and you could buy them cheaply, to me it was like I was completely fascinated. You know, I was uh, – it was like uh, – I was like a kid in the candy store, you know. I, my, my eyes were like so wide open and amazed by this stuff. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't stop getting my hands on them. Whereas kids today, I mean, I, I, my, my own kids – I mean, they like technology. They use technology. They're 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 into it, but they're not into it. Like my daughter, she 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 has a you know she has an iPhone and uh, and uh, she uses the laptop and everything, but she uses it just like you would use a tool. Yeah, exactly. She she didn't give a rat's ass about how it works or learning how it works or why does this do this and that do that. She could care less. You know, it, 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 she's not interested at all. Zero. It's, it's so, yeah. I don't know, maybe it's, it's just just my kids, I guess. <laughs> but uh, no, I, think, no, I think most kids are not interested. And that's what the the, the idea of the, the Raspberry Pi is. And I suppose it's, I say, I oh, will just get a, a, a shitty netbook yeah. and that's got a screen and everything. Right. But it doesn't have the same sort of wow factor of, wow, this tiny little sure, thing is a sure. computer. Yeah. So... Yeah, Interesting. Kind of see the argument for it, but incidentally, looking on eBay UK, yeah, um, someone selling three of those EPCs for 110 quid delivered. That's not bad. Um, three. Yeah, and some someone else wants 50 quid for it uh, with free delivery. I think. Can, oh no, five quid. So 55 quid. Can you even buy a netbook anymore? Can I, I? I haven't seen one for years. Can you actually go to a store and say, "I'll have one of those, please," and get a new netbook? I, I don't think they even make them anymore, do they? Uh, in the UK, you can. Yeah, um, there's there's not many of them, and the ultrabooks have obviously come and well, the, the, them. the iPad and the tablets are like taking away all that market share now, right? No, you know, if if, you, if you're going to buy an EPC or a netbook or or an iPad or a tablet, you're going to go with the tablet. 
Well, yeah. I mean, lab, the the netbook has been sort of replaced at both ends by tablets at the lower end, and and then the uh, the ultra ultrabooks uh, the other end. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's you true. get an Android tablet off eBuyer. They keep sending me uh, newsletters, which I quite like to read. And there's one for fifty quid. Yeah. Um, a seven inch tablet. I mean, obviously, it's not it's nothing. It's not going to do what a high end one will, right? But it's it's amazing. Uh, this is it's got a proper capacitive touchscreen, not a shitty resistive one, right? Uh, so the yeah. thing is, the thing is with those kind of deals, though, you would think, oh, that's great! I'll get that, you know, for my kid's birthday or something. They'll be they'll be thrilled. They'll have a tablet, but no, they won't. They'll be pissed. Yeah, exactly. I wanted an iPad. Yeah, well, they'll least, say, here you go, son. Happy seven. birthday! And they open it up, and it's just, and they're like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. I wanted an but, iPad. But at 50 quid, you're getting into sort of digital picture frame sure. territory. No, but, but I mean, for a hobbyist or somebody who's into it and wants to fuck around with it and play with it, 50 quid, you're like, man, that, that's the bomb. I'm buying that immediately. Yeah, if but, I didn't have so much shit, then I'd buy it. But, but if, uh, but if get, you're giving it as a gift or something, you're just, you're just begging for disappointment. <laughs> yeah, and I do feel a bit bad about that. Yeah, like you see them and your parents who aren't really that tech savvy. And they sure, think, oh, sure. Oh, iPad yeah. For, like, L- little Johnny three. will love this. Let me buy that. Oh, man, they'll be so happy. And then they have the birthday party and they, they blow out the candles and they say, here you go, happy birthday. And the parents are all smiling and happy. Oh, wait till we see his face. And he tears open the box. He's like, what the fuck is this? Mm, I know it's a bit, I do feel bad. There must be parents <laughs> out there who've done it. <laughs> what is this? Or, or it's like, oh, Thanks, Mom and Dad. Thanks. Oh, no, it's great. And then in their head, they're thinking, what the fuck? Ugh, I want an iPad. What is this piece of shit? Exactly. Sad. Anyway, we've gone we've rambled way off topic there, so that's oh, no. yeah, the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> well, I think it's a bit shit, but it's, it's a novelty. Item. It is, yeah. It's a novelty item, but uh, I, I think the, uh, the idea behind it is, is pretty cool. Um, I, I would not buy one at its current state. Um, if it got a little beefier and I could do some home theater shit with it, I, I'd be tempted. But as it is right now, even though it's so cheap, uh, if I bought it, it would just be sitting on the shelf. I wouldn't be using it, you know? Well, I'll look into how much it'll cost to send to California um, and back again, and you could uh, you could borrow it for a while. Maybe. <laughs> All right, cool deal. All right, thank you, Joe. So there you have it, the Raspberry Pi. Well, Joe, that uh, that means we're kind of at the end of this week's show. Another great conversation, another great topic, the Raspberry Pi, something that uh, I am not going to be purchasing in the, the, the near future, but but who knows? Maybe Raspberry Pi 2 will uh, will delve into that and, uh, and get things going. Um, for feedback this week, we haven't had too much feedback, but if you do have any thoughts and or comments about the show, please don't hesitate to shoot us an email at mindsetcentral at gmail.com, or you can shoot over to the Mindset Forum on um, Facebook. It's under The Mindset, and I will post a link in today's show notes so you can check that out. Hope you are enjoying the MindTech podcast. Keep listening. Spread the word. Uh, Next week, we'll be back with more news, more topic, more conversation, and uh, another main topic that we'll get into. Also, if you have any any tech questions, anything you're curious about, or or if you'd like to get our opinion on something, we'll be more than happy to give it. Isn't that right, Joe? Yeah, yeah. If you, recommendations for what to buy, or little tech problems you've got, or big tech problems, whatever. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll rack our brains to uh, to get you an answer, or if not an answer, a certain opinion. In other words, don't do it. You're crazy, or buy that shit immediately. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of thing. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. We'll be back next week with more topics, more conversation, and more news. And until then, farewell, good brothers. See you later. <laughs>